The Hawaii Longline Fishery is Hawaii's largest food producing industry, and its fleet of around 140 vessels target tuna, swordfish, and other pelagic species on fishing grounds that cover more than a thousand mile radius around the islands, and at times extend halfway to California. This fishery provides a critical source of food security to the islands, and its products are renowned for their quality and freshness across the U.S. mainland. In an age when 90% of the seafood consumed by Americans is imported, this U.S.-based fishery is truly a gem. The fishery's reputation for producing premium quality seafood is matched only by its reputation for responsible management. The fishery is one of the most highly regulated in the world, and over the years, its management has evolved in response to a series of challenges. One recurring challenge is the issue of protected species bycatch. Although the fishery is very clean in the sense that most of the non-target fish caught by the fleet are brought to market, unintended interactions with certain species that are either threatened or endangered present unique conservation challenges, and although rare, these interactions have proven to be pivotal impetus for innovation and improvement in the fishery. In the early 2000s, concerns over the fleet's interactions with sea turtles ultimately led to a federal injunction and fishery closure a victory for advocacy groups opposed to commercial fishing, but a disaster for the fleet, which at the time produced the majority of U.S. landed swordfish. After years of collaboration among stakeholder groups, the fleet came back with a robust suite of bycatch mitigation measures that included gear modifications, increased observer coverage, and hard cap limits on turtle interactions, which together allowed the fishery to reopen. While these management measures set a new standard that many fishing nations operating in the Pacific have yet to match, the issue of unintended bycatch in this fishery remains a serious concern, especially as we continue to see the population numbers of certain keystone species in decline. Today, leatherback sea turtles remain under the spotlight, along with certain shark species and toothed whales. The problem is straightforward. How do we continue to utilize this invaluable food resource, while at the same time ensure that our impact on vulnerable species is minimal? However, addressing the problem in a way that balances the stewardship of this marine resource with the diverse interests of stakeholder groups is extremely challenging, and the fishery's ability to thrive often seems to hang precariously in the balance. Hawaiian Fresh Seafood's interest in developing a technological solution to bycatch began in 2016 while I was on a long-line fishing trip offshore of Hawaii. Captain Sam Fee and I were discussing protected species interactions in the fishery and brainstorming what kind of new device might be built to release animals accidentally caught without harming them. Captain Sam brought up the tuna missile, also known as a spider gaff which is best described as a cluster of hooks attached to a long braided line and is used by fishers to secure large fish like tuna and swordfish that otherwise might break off the line before being boarded. Sam proposed, why not take the concept of the tuna missile, but re-engineer it to have the opposite outcome? Upon returning to port, I learned from Andrew Torres, the protected species coordinator at National Marine Fishery Service, that across the country, in the Southeast Atlantic, some work on a line cutter had already been done a few years prior. This project, led by Charles Bergman, had successfully produced a prototype capable of cutting through monofilament leaders. It sounded a lot like the idea Captain Sam and I had been discussing, and I wanted to learn more. Contacting Charles by phone, I learned that his device had achieved some success in the field, but there had been issues with reliability and performance at sea, and ultimately, the idea was put on the shelf. Undeterred, I asked if I could see some design diagrams that he had produced. Becoming familiar with Bergman's prototype was a great start, but it was clear that it would have to be significantly modified for use in the Hawaii fishery in order to accommodate some major gear differences, namely the half meter of braided steel and lead swivels used at the time by our fleet. I wondered, was this a project even worth pursuing for use in the Hawaii longline fishery? I knew I could count on Hawaiian fresh seafood support to get the ball rolling. When it comes to sustainability in the seafood business, talk is cheap and there's a lot of it. If we could lead the way in building a viable line cutter that reduced our fleet's impact on vulnerable species, it would demonstrate not just our company's stated commitment to sustainability, but that commitment in action. I also knew I could draw upon my field experience, working as a National Marine Fisheries Service observer, where I'd spent hundreds of days at sea aboard these vessels, doing my part to contribute to the science that supports the vital management of this fishery. Around this time, I got in touch with Dr. Melanie Hutchinson, an expert on shark bycatch and tuna fisheries, 
Melanie told me that when sharks and other species are accidentally caught and released in longline fisheries, it's actually not the interaction itself that's the main problem. It's the stress that comes with handling and the fishing gear left trailing on the animal that most often leads to harm. An effective line cutter, therefore, could be a game changer, not just in reducing shark mortality, but also for other large animals for which removing trailing gear is difficult, dangerous, or both. Melanie encouraged me to go forward with the project and even offered to provide satellite tags that I could use to prove that sharks released by a new line cutter indeed survived the interaction. With momentum building, I brought the Bergman prototype designs and some long line fishing gear to a local machinist and fabricator in Honolulu. Mr. Moo was familiar with the fishing industry and appreciated the challenge I presented. How do we improve this design and adapt it specifically for Hawaii long line gear and the species we may encounter? Over the course of three weeks, we fabricated a new unit with a re-engineered blade and cutting mechanism capable of traversing the terminal gear and severing the braided steel leader used in the fleet. This new prototype utilized a heavy lawnmower style steel blade and base plate and featured a pigtail wrap to keep the leader in place as it slid down the line. It also incorporated a spring mechanism that kept the blade in the open position. On the day it was assembled, we conducted a test in Moo's workshop and, to my delight, it seemed to work well in this staged environment. But how would it perform in the field? I ran out of Moo's shop and headed straight to the pier where our vessel, Miss Emma, had just tied up earlier that morning. Using a big rock as a proxy for a fish, Hawaiian Fresh Seafood deckhand Joe Bell and I fastened it to a standard longline branch line and threw it overboard. I then attached our brand new prototype onto the line and with some trepidation, I dropped it overboard too. Feeling for the device to make contact with our proxy fish, I then yanked the cord, yanked it again, and it worked. A month later, I was headed out to sea aboard another of our company's vessels, Cumberland Trail, and on board was the new prototype and three satellite tags. Over the course of the trip, Captain Ben, crew, and I managed to apply satellite tags to three incidentally caught blue sharks using the new prototype. We also managed to capture video of the device in action on a number of additional blue shark interactions. These images would prove very helpful later on as the project developed. But over the course of these first at-sea trials, I began to see firsthand what Charles had said about the shortcomings he had experienced while field testing his prototype. The device was clunky. The weight of the stainless steel construction caused the line to sag, at times making it difficult to reach the animal. The cutting mechanism, while very effective in the right circumstances, wasn't perfect either. On a few occasions, multiple pulls were required to completely sever the leader, and once, it failed to cut the leader altogether. And finally, the device itself had an exposed blade, which made it unsafe for operator and animal alike. By trip's end, despite some frustration along the way, we had shown that the device did work, even if not perfectly, in releasing blue sharks with minimal trailing gear while reducing handling and struggle. For the three sharks we released that were satellite tagged, we were able to show that all survived the interaction beyond 30 days. I felt that the prototype had achieved an important milestone. It was a proof of concept, and with a little more work and some design improvements, the line cutter vision could very well come to fruition. In 2019, oceanic white tip sharks joined the leatherback sea turtle on the endangered species list. Sharks are considered keystone species, meaning their presence is critical in maintaining the balance of the whole ocean ecosystem. So once again, fishery managers, scientists, and advocacy groups were scrutinizing the Hawaii longline fishery. All agreed that something had to be done to address the problem. But what? Around this time, the Fishery Council contacted me to inform me that a line cutter was being discussed as a possible solution and encouraged me to apply for a National Marine Fisheries Service bycatch reduction and engineering grant to help aid in further development of the Hawaiian Fresh Seafood Line Cutter. At this point, I knew that for our device to be appropriate for fleet-wide adoption, we were going to need to make significant changes to our existing design. The current device did work, but it was far from being a practical solution. I was up for the effort, but I knew that I needed help to rethink and re-engineer the concept. As fate would have it, I crossed paths with Alex LeBon. Alex is a big wave surfer by morning and a marine engineer by day, and his firm, Mackay Engineering, was interested in getting involved. So Alex, his colleague Don Lasser and I, had our first meeting in the spring of 2019. I showed them the 2016 prototype, 
along with footage I had collected from the At Sea Trials aboard Cumberland Trail. Together, we brainstormed how to improve upon the concept. With the help of our key collaborators and advisors from NOAA Fisheries, John Wang and Daniel Curran, in the following months we put together a proposal for funding and were awarded the opportunity to move forward on design improvements. It was off to the races. By November of 2020, the new prototype had been built out and was ready for dockside testing. The new prototype represented a completely reimagined device. The Mackay team started off with an 18-volt terrestrial bolt cutter and re-engineered all the components into a robust line cutter design. Underwater housings were built for the motor and electronics. The blade mechanism was coupled to a 90-degree gearbox, and new blades of heat-treated, tooled steel were added so that the device would be capable of cutting through the hook. The components were carefully arranged in an aluminum frame to aid water dynamically, and a Delrin clamshell chute was fabricated to allow the unit to smoothly traverse the line. Finally, all components were housed in a highly visible Pelican-style case, durable enough to handle rough marine environments, and connected to the remote control via a 1,000-pound test fiber-optic umbilical. The prototype was looking great, and it was time for a dockside test. Fixing a standard branch line to the seafloor to simulate a large marine animal on the line, the prototype entered the ocean environment for the first time off the Mackay Pier in early November of 2020. After the unit filled with water, it smoothly traversed down the line, over the weighted swivel, and made contact with the hook at the end. The blades were then remotely engaged by the operator at the surface, and the wire leader was quickly severed. Subsequent tests produced the same positive result. The unit appeared to work flawlessly, but this was a highly controlled environment and extra precautions were taken that would not be practical in a real world at sea scenario. There was only one way to find out if our new prototype could handle the unpredictable and dynamic high seas landscape. It was time to take the new device, one year in the making, and test it in the field aboard a long line fishing vessel. By this time, the Hawaiian Fresh Seafood fleet had relocated to San Diego, and the opportunity arose to take the new prototype on a fishing trip aboard Hawaiian Fresh Seafood vessel Sea Hunt. Captain JB, the crew, and I had all spent time at sea together and were already familiar with the line cutter project. We knew it was unlikely we'd encounter either leatherback sea turtles or oceanic white tips, but did expect to interact with a handful of blue sharks. On the way out to the fishing grounds, I discussed the mission with Captain JB, Alex, and the crew over a series of training sessions. And, after a few days of travel, the fishing operations were set to begin. On the first night of fishing, I brought the line cutter on deck, standing by and ready for its first deployment, whenever the opportunity might arise. Just before midnight on November 23rd, a blue shark was spotted on the fishing gear and I sprang into action. With the crew's help, I managed to easily secure the branch line into the clamshell and lock the device. I took some extra time to double check the latches, and then with a splash, pushed the prototype through the fish door and into the water. Just like at Mackay Pier, the unit quickly filled with water began traversing the line towards the shark. Guiding it down with the umbilical, I could clearly feel when it had made contact with the shark, and I engaged the cutting mechanism. Almost immediately, I felt the line go slack, and as I began to retrieve the device, I could see the shark swimming down and away. I pulled the prototype on deck and went to examine the line. Everything but the hook and about 10 centimeters of trailing gear were recovered. It was a fantastic first deployment. Over the course of the next few days, three more opportunities arose to deploy the line cutter. It continued to perform flawlessly, and with each trial, the time it took to release the shark began to shorten. But it was proving difficult to operate the cameras, as well as be the main prototype operator. So for the fifth deployment, and every time thereafter, I handed all operating responsibilities to deck boss Alex and the crew, while I focused on capturing video angles of the releases. Unsurprisingly, in the hands of this experienced fishing crew, the device performed even better than it had for me. The time it took to release the sharks got shorter and shorter, and even more fishing gear was retrieved. On two deployments, the line cutter had successfully removed all of the trailing gear, leaving only the hook remaining in the mouth of the released shark. For all deployments, the average time it took from the shark being observed hooked on the line to its release was only two minutes. The average time from when the line cutter entered the water to when the shark was released was just 20 seconds. Every single trial was successful, and that struggle was minimal, the shark swam away in good condition, and most or all of the trailing gear had been recovered. 
On two occasions, I was able to capture all three of my desired camera angles, including the elusive underwater perspective. This video footage, along with the data we collected, provided strong testament to the success of the new prototype. Unlike with the 2016 line cutter trials, where a smooth cut was far from guaranteed and on a few occasions practically impossible, this new prototype had no problem cleanly cutting through the gear. Just as important, the new prototype's neutrally buoyant design provided a much smoother traverse over the fishing line, eliminated sag, and was more easily deployed and operated. By the end of the fishing trip, we had released nearly all of the blue sharks caught using the line cutter. We headed back to San Diego with an ice hold full of tuna and in good spirits. The Hawaiian fresh seafood line cutter had proven itself at sea, and there were 14 blue sharks successfully released unharmed back in their home. Upon returning to port, I learned that the Hawaii Longline Association had agreed to adopt monofilament leaders as a strategy to mitigate post-hooking mortality of oceanic whitetip sharks. This was a big move for the fleet and took some of the spotlight away from our line cutter solution. But the line cutter, and specifically our new prototype, remains a viable solution for dealing with other large marine animals that are difficult or dangerous to interact with. Furthermore, with one more round of funding, we expect to be able to produce a final prototype half the size and ready for mass production and fleet-wide adoption. We are hopeful that this industry-led body of work will be recognized by scientists, managers, and advocacy groups alike and be a valuable addition to the suite of bycatch mitigation techniques already in place in our fishery. Our line cutter technology could be especially useful in mitigating the fleet's impact on the critically endangered false killer whale. And there is major replicability potential for this device to offer solutions to protected species interactions in other longline fisheries throughout the world. And perhaps best of all, our project serves as an important success story for industry-led bycatch solutions achieved through cross-stakeholder collaboration.